Well, good morning, everyone. It looks like our attendees are still some coming in, but we have uh, one after 8.30 here, and I'd like to get started. On behalf of Citizens for Modern Transit, I'd like to welcome all of you to our quarterly Talking Transit event, uh, the intersection of transit and jobs, driving economic opportunity in St. Louis. My name is Hart Nelson. I have the honor of serving as the chair of the board for Citizens for Modern Transit. And I wanna thank all of CMT's board members who have joined us this morning. And I'd also like to thank CMT's platinum and gold sponsors, including AARP of St. Louis, Bi-State Development, Emerson, BJC Healthcare, Greater St. Louis Incorporated, Missouri and Kansas City Laborers District Council, Ulico, and Washington University in St. Louis. We certainly would not be able to provide these updates without their support, so thank you very much. As St. Louis returns its focus to job creation and strategies to build back the urban core, what can transit's impact be on this vision? That's the conversation we're gonna have today. And we're gonna look at the intersection of transit and jobs and its impact on boosting economic growth, increasing the number of quality living wage jobs and reducing racial disparities in employment and wealth generation to boost opportunities for all. Today's discussion will highlight how the transit system can serve as a driving force for this economic growth while reducing racial disparities. It should be a very interesting conversation and we have a world-class panel here today to speak with you. But now I'd like to invite CMT's Executive Director, Kim Sella, to get us started. Thanks very much. Thank you, Hart. And thank you again to everyone who is joining us today for this really important conversation. This topic today will have impacts on the future of transit in the region and what that vision looks like for years to come, including where we invest in infrastructure, the location of jobs, and access creation to those jobs. I had the opportunity on our planning call to begin the dialogue with these panelists we have here this morning, and it was an exciting conversation, and it probably could have lasted all afternoon. I knew then that I, what I hope that you will hear this morning, that these individuals have a vision and a passion to ensure no matter what job sector, that the future is bright for the region through the intersection with public transit. So please join me in welcoming our panel of experts this morning. We have Sam Murphy, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for Greater St. Louis, Inc. Bruce Katz is the founder at New Localism Associates. Patty Hagen is the president of the Technology Entrepreneur Center and founding executive director of T-Rex Innovation Center. June McAllister Fowler is the senior VP for communications, marketing, and public affairs at BJC Healthcare. And Talby Roach is the president and CEO at Bi-State Development Metro Transit. After our presentation from our speakers, we will open it up to Q&A as well as any other commentary that we have. We also have with us Jim Wild, the Executive Director of East West Gateway, and he will be here to answer any of the technical questions. We're calling him our resident technical expert. So let's get started this morning by allowing our panelists to provide a quick overview of their backgrounds and how transit intersects with their work. So please, as a reminder, leave your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. But I'd like to welcome Sam Murphy and also welcome him to the CMT board. So thank you, Sam, for joining us and welcome aboard. Thank you, Kim, and good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join today's panel discussion with such a fantastic group of civic leaders and colleagues. Um, as Kim said, my name is Sam Murphy, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Greater St. Louis Incorporated. January 1st, 2021, not only marked the start of a new year, um, but also the start of an unprecedented shift in the way that our business community will work together to help create jobs and drive economic growth in the future. Uh, it was the start of Greater St. Louis Incorporated. Five private sector uh, business organizations, including Civic Progress, Downtown STL Inc., Alliance STL, Arch to Park, and the St. Louis Regional Chamber combined on January 1st of this year to create Greater St. Louis Incorporated, a flagship economic development organization for the private sector that speaks with a unified voice and leads with a bold agenda focused on creating jobs, expanding opportunity for everyone in our region, and improving St. Louis's global competitiveness. 
Working as one team creates greater alignment around key policy issues, such as transportation. We want to set a new standard for addressing issues in our region and getting things done uh, in a way that is rooted in shared civic purpose and collaboration. To share a little bit about my background, as, as Kim asked, I came to Greater St. Louis, Inc. Uh, after holding a number of leadership roles in both the public and private sector. I joined Greater St. Louis, Inc. through the integration of one of our predecessor organizations, Arch to Park, where I had served as Vice President of Public Affairs. Prior to that role, I was based in Germany. I lived in Cologne, Germany, as the head of global issues management for Bayer Crop Science, and certainly had the pleasure of enjoying the world-class transit infrastructure uh, throughout Cologne, North Rhine-Westphalia, and, and Germany. I was with Bayer uh, and the former Monsanto company uh, for seven years. Um, and prior to my time with Monsanto, I was the communications director um, and a member of the senior staff for former Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. And in the governor's administration, economic development, uh, job creation, and workforce development and infrastructure were policy areas where I had significant responsibilities. In creating Greater St. Louis, Inc., we based on our, our model of best-in-class examples of how private sector groups in other metros like Charlotte, Denver, and Pitt Pittsburgh organize themselves and drive economic development. And certainly one of the common themes that we see across those metro areas is their focus on transit and the link between transit and job creation, both in connecting existing residents within those metros to job opportunities, but also attracting younger talent, new workers into those regions. Charlotte and its 2030 transit corridor system plan um, is truly is best in class in looking at linking uh, their area's key centers of economic activity. Denver, a, a national model uh, for addressing transportation challenges, connecting that to sustainability, getting people from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, Pittsburgh, the home of the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, um, has a clear focus on transit-oriented development strategies um, both to increase economic competitiveness, but also reduce congestion and lower transit costs and focus on sustainability. Um, so we look at those regions and how their business communities are organized around these flagship institutions as we designed our focus for Greater St. Louis, Inc. Um, and placed our, our clear focus on speaking with a unified voice on important policy issues. As Kim mentioned in my role, I recently joined the Board of Citizens for Modern Transit. Um, and I'll also be representing Greater St. Louis, Inc. and the broader business community, West Gateway's Executive Advisory Committee. Um, from a, a focus on our priorities um, as Greater St. Louis, Inc., um, as they relate to transit, um, we're a key partner um, on some really innovative projects within the Metro. Uh, one at the top of that list is the Tower Grove Connector, a $9 million, 1.9 mile protected uh, pedestrian and cycle track um, that's going to be constructed from Tower Grove Park up through Forest Park Southeast. Um, the connector is going to improve access to public transit, job centers, reduce congestion, um, and also create just a world-class amenity um, in one of the fastest growing areas within our, within our metro um, and help lead to, to a greater quality of life. Um, we're very much focused on, on uh, technical options like bus rapid transit to connect the entire metro um, to job opportunities and improve quality of life. Uh, we were an, an outspoken champion this year on a critical legislative priority uh, focused on, on transit and infrastructure. Uh, the first increase in Missouri's motor fuel tax in more than 20 years that will generate an additional 500 million per year uh, to go into, into our transit infrastructure and roads and bridges. Um, and transit also features very prominently uh, in something that Bruce Katz will be talking with us about this morning, um, and that's the 2030 Jobs Plan, uh, which uh, Greater St. Louis Inc. Um, will, will help guide and steward over the next decade. Um, it's a key priority for organization, and Bruce in the, in the plan will be talking about inclusive growth, um, which has to be our North Star as, as a metro, and involves both increasing the number of quality jobs for all St. Louisans, while reducing disparities, racial and spatial disparities um, that have held um, primarily black and brown residents within our metro back um, from being able to participate fully in our region's economic growth. An efficient transportation infrastructure is going to offer a wider pool of residents um, opportunities to find good paying jobs, um, quality jobs um, that can help lift those families um, and help them generate, uh, generate wealth and pass that on to future generations. The 2030 Jobs Plan also focuses critically on restoring the, restoring the urban core 
and creating density, both residential and employment density uh, within the center of our metro. And transit is, is absolutely critical there. We also see transit as critical to workforce development and attracting new jobs, competitive talent to our metro. Younger workers in different markets are looking for places where they can live uh, in close proximity to their jobs, um, enjoy a carless lifestyle, and we think that that's absolutely critical to the future of, of our region. So when it comes to driving job creation and, in, and creating inclusive growth, Greater St. Louis Inc. and our business community must speak with a unified voice and lead with a bold agenda uh, to move St. Louis forward. And that will absolutely be our focus here at Greater St. Louis Inc. We really think we can play a leading role. Bruce will go into some additional detail about specific strategies that we'll be helping champion uh, within the 2030 jobs plan. Um, we've got tremendous community engagement and feedback throughout the process of creating that plan. And we hope that you too will be excited about the goals uh, that are laid out in the 2030 jobs plan and the vision that Greater St. Louis Inc. is helping steward for our community. And we invite you to join us. Uh, in our first six months in operation, um, we've seen a number of new, uh, new leaders within the business community step forward. Um, and decide to become a highly engaged and a part of the work that we're doing here at Greater St. Louis Inc. And we would love to have you join us as well. Uh, we value uh, new voices and new perspectives at the table of our business community, uh, and we want to lead and move forward together. Um, if you'd like any more information about Greater St. Louis Inc. involved, uh, please visit greaterstlinc.com. Greater We'd love to hear from you and welcome you to our organization. Kim, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn it over to Bruce. Bruce Katz is the founder at New Localism Associates. And Bruce, if you'd like to jump in. Well, well, thank you very much. And it's uh, great to be with everyone this morning. Um, so I am the founder of New Localism Associates. I work with cities in the US and outside the US on transformative initiatives to drive inclusive and sustainable growth. Uh, I also run a finance lab at Drexel. I've been at the Brookings Institution. I was chief of staff at HUD under Clinton. And a long time ago, this will give you a sense of how old I am, um, I was on the Senate Banking Committee when we passed the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act in 1991, the so-called Ice-T Act, which essentially gave cities and metropolitan areas a greater flexibility in the allocation of federal resources and began to level the playing field between highway expenditures and investments in rail and transit and bus rapid transit and other modes of transportation. Um, let me just talk briefly about the STL 2030 jobs plan because uh, what is critical to understand, and I'll just put in the chat um, a newsletter I put out last week, um, essentially, St. Louis, the business and civic leadership, because this started under civic progress and has now been taken under the aegis of greater STL, as Sam was talking about. St. Louis used 2020 and the pandemic to basically plan for the future. And uh, it was a very good use of time, though there were a lot of Zoom calls involved, um, because we anticipated that we might have a moment of unprecedented and historic federal investment, uh, both to help rescue the economy from the impact of the pandemic, but more importantly, begin to restructure the economy towards an inclusive and sustainable future. So um, take a look at the STL 2030 jobs plan. But as Sam said, the North Star of this plan is inclusive growth. And we defined inclusive growth in a particular way given St. Louis's situation. There's almost a dual focus. On one hand, St. Louis needs to grow quality jobs while at the same time simultaneously, simultaneously reducing racial and spatial disparities on income, health, and wealth. And that's because St. Louis's starting point post the Great Recession is quite different from most other metropolitan areas in the United States. And I'm talking large metro. St. Louis is the 20th largest metro in the United States. On one hand, St. Louis experienced sluggish growth coming out of the Great Recession, and that stretches over the past several decades. On the other hand, what we, what we discovered was there was a level of employment decentralization, dispersion in the St. Louis metropolitan area 
which is second only to Detroit. And what that means is that the greater downtown of the city of St. Louis is missing about 130,000 jobs. And when you think about how the US economy is spatially organized, many successful metros, particularly the high flyers of the past 25 years, and I'm not talking just about the coast, I'm talking about Denver and Austin and Nashville and Indianapolis and Minneapolis, what they experienced was a rebound of the core of their cities. Uh, and some of that has occurred in St. Louis, particularly in what we would call a midtown area like Cortex. But the downtown area, where T-Rex and others are located, which is historic from an, from an outside observer, beautiful architecture, great grid, unbelievable amenities along the river, but it hasn't performed at the same level as many peer metropolitan areas in the United States. So the focus of the jobs plan on inclusive growth was intensely focused on restoring the core as a platform, as a foundation for quality jobs uh, in the St. Louis metropolitan area, not just the city, not just the county, but the entire metropolitan area on both sides of the river. And so what you'll see when you read this is a series of strategies, some which are really locally generated, what we called an STL pledge, major anchor institutions, companies, eds, meds, utilities committing to buy local, hire local, invest local, and locate a portion of their growing jobs in the core of the city, um, but also a series of initiatives that would enable the entire metro to leverage your distinctive competitive advantages, which actually are located very much in the core, whether it's biosciences and your distinctive focus on human health and plant science, Wash U, Cortex, SLU, Barnes Jewish Hospital, et cetera, whether it's the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which is now located very close to where uh, Patty has an office um, and, and very much engaged with T-Rex, um, and which really puts you at the center of location science and geospatial and emerging next generation technology, whether it's FinTech because of Square, or whether it's our recommendation that you build an advanced manufacturing innovation center to enable you to take full advantage of the reshoring of manufacturing and have that be centrally located near Rankin Tech, near the downtown, near Cortex and so forth. So a very large portion of this inclusive growth plan, whether it's focus on steps you can take locally or steps you can um, leverage federal investments at this unprecedented moment around innovation, infrastructure, human capital is around growing St. Louis uh, as really the, the quality jobs tech hub it is. Um, and I think as you move forward, um, I, I think you will find that the, the time everyone spent during 2020 to co-create this and co-invent it, and a big shout out to Hart Nelson, who's the moderator here for basically co-chairing our, our talent and skills work group. I think this was time well spent. You are, you are ready to basically draw down more than your fair share of federal money and put it towards the purpose of inclusive growth in general and urban regeneration and metropolitan prosperity in specific. So Kim, that's a general overview of the 2030 jobs plan. Thank you, thank you very much, Bruce. I now, Bruce just touched on it, the technology community is very important to the future of St. Louis. And I'd now like to introduce Patty Hagen the president of Technology Entrepreneur Center and the founding executive director of the T-Rex Innovation Center. Welcome, Patty. Thanks, Kim. And it's an honor to be on this, uh, with this group today. So thank you for inviting me. Um, well, talking about technology and growth in downtown, um, what we're engaged with at T-Rex is um, creating a technology hub for downtown that can serve the entire region and the state, um, but that can specifically create a hub of energy and excitement and talent and expertise so that downtown can leverage those ingredients 
and really um, be able to uh, accomplish even more inclusive economic growth. Um, quickly, I, I know you said you wanted to know something about our backgrounds. I spent a lot of time at St. Louis University as an academic administrator and as an academic and, um, and then um, moved on to nonprofit uh, creation and management. So now I find myself at t -Rex, um, helping to grow this institution into a sustainable asset for our region and for downtown into the future. And in my old age, I'm hopeful that as I move on in the future, that this T-Rex institution will serve our community for a very long time. Um, since um, we moved into our historic building on Washington Avenue, um, we've um, counted over 5,000 jobs created as a result of uh, T-Rex's um, and its partners' um, um, efforts and the companies, the startup companies and the companies that want to be part of our ecosystem that become involved with us. So that's been really important for St. Louis. And what that has done is spurred additional growth. So um, in bringing, you know, we're very clear about our uh, desire to bring resources um, as a nonprofit, to bring resources to our institution, to um, lower the level of barriers for innovation and for startups um, to get going. So just as a quick example of that, co-working space at T-Rex is $50 a month. And for that, you, you get space and, and partnerships and free coffee. <laughs> so we really try to uh, reduce those barriers for people. One of our latest, um, well, it hasn't been the latest. Since 2016, we've been working with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency here in town as they um, uh, made their decision to um, build their new campus 1.4 miles away from us. Um, directly north of um, downtown here where we're located. Um, we really saw this as an opportunity for St. Louis early on. And in addition to that, started working with Senator Blunt's team. And in the long run, what that has turned into is a very special relationship with the NGA so that um, as we continue to leverage that relationship and look forward to how we can build these resources for our community, we ended up building the first of its kind geospatial innovation center, first of its kind in the nation um, in T-Rex. And, um, and then, this is exciting, on Friday, we will open the first of its kind facility um, with the NGA called Moonshot Labs in St. Louis. And this is the only um, uh, innovation center that NGA has stood up of its kind. We're really proud of that relationship and building that over time. So what we've been able to do is gather a lot of um, activity and participants and interest nationally and even internationally to what we're doing here downtown. Um, the Globe Building has benefited as well from these activities. Maxar has moved into the Globe Building. The Post-Dispatch Building is close by us. Square just recently moved into um, the Post-Dispatch Building. And the Convention Center is a close partner of ours as well. Um, and in, you know, finally, I'll just say that in building these resources, we raise funding, we write grants, we bring in partners. One example of that is we just recently received a half million dollar um, federal grant from the EDA to construct an extended reality lab, um, which will um, work on innovations and um, um, uh, entrepreneurism around augmented and virtual reality. And um, that is one of the NGA's focus areas. And it's also an important component of how we can look at um, adding value to remote learning experiences, as well as convention center and tourism opportunities. So there's a lot going on. There's more to come. And um, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing for downtown. Thank you, Patty. Another key sector in the St. Louis market is healthcare, and I'd like to welcome June McAllister Fowler, the Senior VP of Communications, Marketing, and Public Relations, Public Affairs. I, I apologize, June, at BJC Healthcare. 
you're on mute, June. June. Oh, there you go. I think I'm off mute now. Good morning. Thank you, Kim, and, and welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wish I were just a listener because I have been so uh, energized by what I've heard from the panelists so far. Um, it's, it's almost like a, 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 I don't know, almost like a love letter uh, to St. Louis when I think of the 2030 jobs plan. And the thing that I would want all of the um, listeners to know, all of the viewers to know, is that the 2030 jobs plan starts right now. You know, it, it, it started even before the ink was dry on the study. Uh, it is so critically important to how we think differently about economic development in our region. Uh, inclusivity is the thing. A um, little about my background, I started the first 16 years of my career as an urban planner uh, in St. Louis. And I started in, in, in the go-go 80s. And I call it the go-go 80s because I was in St. Louis County and we were looking at absolutely phenomenal growth in all sectors, residential, commercial, retail. Growth was astonishing in St. Louis County, but you only had to come into St. Louis City to see that growth was astonishing in, in St. Louis City. Uh, Bruce said he aged himself with iced tea. I'm gonna age myself with UDAG grants, which allowed St. Louis Center to open in 1985. Right on the heels of that was the reopening of Union Station, which had been closed for many, many years. What we saw with all of that development was it came, it stagnated, and then it started to decline. And, and I think what we know now is when you have these major uh, investments that are very siloed, you know what the ultimate outcome is going to be. None of that development was connected to each other. None of that development thought about the people part of who are the folks who are going to get these jobs? How are they going to travel to these jobs and what's sustainable? What I love about the 2030 plan is all of that was thought about from the jump. So uh, I'm very excited about where we're headed. Uh, as, as Bruce and Sam said, the fact that we had the pandemic ended up being uh, what I would call economically positive for us with the over half a billion dollars that will be invested in the city of St. Louis, another quarter of a billion uh, in St. Louis County. And if we do this right, we won't have a St. Louis Center, a union station that is now in a new re revamp uh, to look at as, as our legacy. Uh, so I kind of like Sam, I've worked in all three sectors, started in government, went to uh, the private sector and am now at BJC Healthcare, a large not-for-profit. One of the things we know at BJC is that transit matters. Public transportation matters. You know, we hire folks, every, you know, we hire brain surgeons and we hire folks who don't have a GED and then work with uh, our team members to help them along the educational continuum. Hart Nelson and the St. Louis Community College are a key partner of ours. And Hart won't do this, but I will remind everybody on August 6th, we have the opportunity to go to the polls and make a decision about investing in our St. Louis Community College infrastructure system. And I do consider it an infrastructure system because they help folks get to uh, the skills that they need to for jobs. Critically important for BJC, we're the largest private employer in the region. And again, we hire along the continuum. What we know about our team members is that some of our team members choose to take public transportation and transit to get to their jobs. Some of them are absolutely reliant on it. The same thing for our patients. We know that some choose and we know that some are reliant. I love people who choose. I focus on those who are absolutely reliant. We as BJC have made investments in the Central West End station, which along with Bi-State, we are revamping that station, which is the busiest along the transit route. 
We made investments in Cortex because we are bringing jobs from other places, our administrative jobs. We have brought them from outside of the core and reloaded, relocated them in the Cortex region. We will continue to do that. So public transit, public transportation is extremely important. The other thing I'll share uh, before I, I, I yield my time is that as we at BJC have also been engaged in strategic planning, one of our core um, focuses is in improving community health. We know that only about 20% of what happens inside of one of our excellent hospitals will decide the outcome of someone's long-term health. The best way to ensure that someone is healthy and has great outcomes is for them to have a job. So we have started to look upstream at what are those levers that we can help to be a catalyst, help to pull so that our residents of this region can be as healthy as possible. And again, if you're chronically ill, you do need a hospital. But if you don't have a job, your ability to live a full life, your ability to, you know, have the kind of food you need, live in the kind of community that supports, you know, what you need for your children is definitely diminished. I think of public transit and public transportation as the great connector to get people to jobs. That to me, and again, when we think about inclusive, connected economic development, we have to think about doing this together. And again, so I'm a, I'm a, a, a total advocate for what we see in the 2030 jobs plan. And with that, Kim, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Duke. Thank you for those very thoughtful comments. I'd now like to introduce Talby Roach, the President and CEO at Bi State Development Metro Transit. So, Talby, welcome to the party, as we like to say. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Good morning, everybody. What a what a fabulous right. panel. So, wow. So I've been really in my role uh, a little over two years, but if you count the past 14 months, I think those are dog years. I feel like I've been here much longer through the pandemic, but I think we're all struggling through that time. But, you know, what's really interesting to me is you know, in these moments of change, when we're looking at our cities and our neighborhoods and so on, how even through a pandemic, how do we relook at who we are and who we wanna be? And, and I guess that's kind of the point that I wanna make in this discussion and kind of really an interesting pivot point that I think we have in the jobs plan. And that is to really look at leading our city into something that it needs to be, is we need to put people first. Put people first because the quality and character of our built environment has a profound impact on people's lives. June just talked about that a little bit about how healthcare is related to jobs. You know, this is all kind of a fabric and indeed kind of a transportation fabric, but a life fabric that means and gives us a way as a city to become who we want to be. Not a, not a St. Louis of 1985 or 1995, and I love those decades too, but where do we want to be indeed in 2030? And, you know, Bruce brought up the point of ice tea, and thank, thanks for that, Bruce. Those are the tools in our box, whatever the modern machinations of those are, to help us get to that change. And, and the ice tea is a, is a very good example, and, and you've seen this across the area. When we've started to look at how are we changing our transportation infrastructure, what are the things that our customers are asking for? Well, you're, you're seeing bike trails, pedestrian access, you're seeing access to transit, you're seeing the change across our greater metropolitan area. And what I think, you know, I would really uh, challenge us all to do, because I'm frustrated too, we, we, we are, um, the same things that held us back in the 80s and the 90s are the same things that hold us back today, that kind of segmentation, okay? How, are, how do we get away from our parochialism? And I think what's really neat about the 2030 plan and maybe about this discussion today is that we need to, to measure our success on a regional basis, not a parochial or municipal basis, on a regional basis. 
the, the other uh, areas across the country that are having success are successing as regions. And after all, we are, we are competing against them. And, and I think that this kind of a discussion and an honest assessment of how we are and how our infrastructure can help us you know, defeat that and become the region that we want to is the kind of discussion that we need to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelby. And thank you, everyone, for your introductions and a little bit of where you're coming from with regards to public transit. I think that sets the stage very well for the conversation that we're about to have. So let's talk a little bit about the future. And as a reminder to everyone who is on this webinar, if you have a question for our panelists, please feel free to put those in the Q&A or in the chat box, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. When we look to the future, 2030, that number has come up quite frequently in the last 30 minutes. What transportation transit project do you believe will have the biggest impact on the ability to impact job growth in the St. Louis market? Anyone want to jump in? Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I will. All right, I'll start. So I, I think there's no question, and the region has looked at the north side, south side expansion, whether that be BRT or Metrolink, okay? And as Bruce mentioned, we are at a unique point where we can compete for unprecedented federal dollars um, and look at attracting those dollars. What, are, what the challenge is to, uh, to us is to come up with a regional cogent strategy that helps us compete for those dollars. You know, I, I, say the, I say this to staff all the time. Our job is to put compelling, interesting projects on the desks of our elected so that they can go in Washington and fight for those dollars. It's, it, it's pretty much that, <laughs> that simple. But we need to be unified about what that approach is. So I think north side, south side, and reaching into the, into the parts of the community, ensuring equity, and getting that job access that we're all talking about into the areas that, look, we haven't been brave enough to get up to the north side. Let's, let's just be honest about that. And we need to be cutting edge. But I'm also going to add um, that on, in Illinois, the light rail extension out to mid-America, for instance, using the Illinois side of the ledger is also a really changing type environment. And I think you saw announcements this morning about expansion of mid-America airport and what are, what are the things that are happening out there? Um, I think both of those have potential to be really changing projects in the built environment and where people work and where they live. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and, and Tom beat, beat me to it. I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, we have to look at those parts of our community that have not been able to enjoy the economic um, rebirth that has happened in other areas. You know, I, I'm on the Cortex board. I absolutely love Cortex. I applaud everything that Patty uh, is doing at T-Rex, but outside of those kind of two big quarters, the downtown, which again, as, as Bruce said, we do need to invest in. But if you look at North St. Louis, and if you look at North St. Louis over years of, um, I'll call it laser fair disinvestment, because you know, Dollars go where uh, investors believe there's growth. One of the things we, we understand now is that part of growth is looking at opportunities for people who have been left out of the ability to move ahead. And so I think if we don't look at the north side, and again, north side, south side, if we don't look at that and make that a priority, we will be back to the go-go 80s and a St. Louis center and a union station that ultimately will fail because the whole community won't be lifted. So, I mean, I just, and, and when you talk about inclusive economic growth, you're talking about opportunities for people. So, so with, with what June and Toby mentioned in the North side, South side as a priority from the transit perspective, Bruce and Sam, what do you believe we need to sell that as a priority project to our local business leadership and get them on board? So you ref June referred to the 2030 jobs plan as a love letter to St. Louis. Well, how do we make sure that transit is a part of that love letter and that local business component, those 
those business leaders in this community understand that that's a key component of the love, the love letter and the relationship. So what do we need to do to engage them on that? Sure. I'll, I'll step in first and then Bruce, welcome your, your thoughts as well. I mean, Kim, I think, I think you're seeing that engagement, you know, with the, with the commissioning of Bruce's work around the 2030 jobs plan and making that declaration um, that, that our, our growth, our, our economic growth North Star for the next decade has to be of inclusive growth. Um, you know, I think seeing the business community come together to, um, to undertake that planning process, um, to, to engage broadly around the priorities in the 2030 jobs plan, and then to put it out there and declare this is, this is where we need to go from a, a set of priorities um, is, is, is a really important shift for, for St. Louis. Um, and I think as part of that, um, we have to, you know, as a business community, as a broader community, acknowledge and recognize that transit is critical to job growth and job creation. Um, there was an article I came across in, in Bloomberg a couple, couple weeks ago um, that, that said, you know, that bad transportation is a tax on business productivity. Um, you know, if, we do, if you do not have a strong and robust transit infrastructure, um, you, are, you are diminishing your ability as a community to compete for growth. And, and a community's competitiveness is largely determined um, by the quality both of its, of its, of its workforce. Um, and so we have to have strategic investments in connecting people to job opportunities um, to, allow, um, to allow our economy to grow. Um, so I think this is a decade where we're going to have to come together and really collaborate in new ways um, around multimodal uh, options and solutions for, for St. Louis. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something that I think the business community um, is, is committed to do. It's declared as a priority in the 2030 jobs plan. Um, and we need to, to follow that plan in the decade to come. Uh, Bruce, anything you wanna, wanna add? Yeah, I think, I think transit uh, advances the jobs plan in two ways. Um, first, um, through development around transit hubs, and second, by enabling greater mobility, uh, particularly for low and moderate income workers. Um, the, develop, the development of transit in many parts of the United States uh, really allowed for the bulking up of quality jobs in the cores of cities. And this is obviously the light rail, the traditional transit, but also bus rapid transit. If you think about the Euclid corridor in Cleveland, between the downtown of Cleveland and uh, where Case Western and the Cleveland Clinic are located. So my sense is that there needs to be almost on the development side, almost equal focus on building out the transit. And I think St. Louis is tailor made for BRT. Um, but also focusing perhaps with incentives given market conditions, the mixed use uh, build out of these hubs. Um, and particularly if you go outside of, of the city into the county and just having been to some of the transit stops there, you know, there are transit stops essentially in parking lots. Whereas it's, so it's just leaving an enormous amount of value off the table. Uh, by not uh, leveraging these public uh, investments. Um, I, I, I really do believe that so much of what should be St. Louis's focus, and you're not, you're gonna find a willing partner in the federal government because they have sent a signal, a very clear signal that equity has to be baked into all decisions. And the more you focus on either building transit uh, on the north side or giving people on the north side access uh, to quality jobs, um, the more you're gonna get a very receptive audience from the federal government. So I would, I would separate out the development vehicle versus the mobility side and begin to think through the different ways in which that might ultimately enable uh, inclusive growth to, 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 to be propelled. So, um, Bruce, with that, uh, this question came up on our um, pre-conversation, but are there any studies, case studies, that demonstrate that transit can actually import people with a robust transit infrastructure in place? Well, I think, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I think, you know, transit um, has its m biggest effect 
when it's it's done in concert with job creation, um, mostly done by growing from within as opposed to attracting from without. But it has its big, biggest effect when economic development and placemaking and mobility are all pulled together into one powerful source. So at times it's hard to know, you know, the chicken and the egg to some of this, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and, but I, I do think that those places that have been able um, to, to not just restore the core, but to catalyze sort of a, a sustainable, consistent trajectory of quality job growth off of industries and technologies and sectors and clusters that are distinctive to metropolitan areas, um, to different metropolitan areas. I, I think this is a sort of a, a bundle. Um, and so I, I, and that's why I think this conversation is so hel helpful because many transit conversations or transportation conversations, even today, 2021, tends to happen in silos and compartments. The federal government funds in silos and compartments, right? They send the money down for X or Y or Z. It's up to localities to braid and blend the funding and then to put them in the service of some larger growth uh, trajectory. So I, I think your bottom line, having been around St. Louis for the past you know, year and a half, two years, you've got a group of practitioners who understand the synthesis, who understand how all this comes together. And I, I, you know, I have no doubt that you can put together some of the most compelling proposals either to deploy block grant funding or to compete for other funding. And then most importantly, leverage up private and civic capital and private and civic actors to maximize the inclusive effect of all this. Okay, so we do have Jim Wilde on the phone, the executive director of East West Gateway, but what actions as panelists do you believe we need to see from the regionally elected officials to ensure the success of the intersection of jobs and transit? Well, well I would, I would, I'd kind of echo of what Bruce's comment is. So, and that is there, there, Unfortunately, our systems are uh, just by the nature of the money flow, there is some segmentation. And, you know, for instance, the monies tend to be transit specific and FTA who, who funds a good deal of our money is there, there about transit. But of course, if we move to improve a city, I, I, we can't have the mistake of essentially we will uh, we'll build transit and there's going to be vacant lots next to them. What are we doing with those vacant lots? And those that means that there are other uh, policies and important uh, initiatives, whether it be HUD, whether it be local uh, SLDC, or whether it be um, any of the municipal actors to then bring a combination of, of effect so that we can really make a difference up in those corridors, whether it be north side or south side. Because let's be honest, we are literally rebuilding the infrastructure of those areas. These are areas that have suffered from decades of infrastructure disinvestment. And so there needs to be a bigger effort than simply building a train or bus down that corridor. It needs to be more. You need to think of how are you looking at rebuilding a community in a neighborhood, one that is also sensitive to the needs of the folks who are still there. Um, and that, that is a kind of a complex milieu of, you know, of really placemaking is one of the words, but also thinking down to the individual level and what are the neighborhoods that we want to create. Um, and that's very important that we engage, and in particular, I'm the, I'm the transit guy, but we, we engage more than that. We engage the local leadership, we engage, you know, our local electives so that we bring it down to the neighborhood level where we're talking about where are people walking, where are they shopping, where are they, where's their job? Um, these are all interrelated factors and we need to avoid, you know, just talking specifically, you know, to transit. Transit is just a tool, a tool for a city, okay? How do we use that tool to build it into something better? And that is hopefully relating to those other policies. And maybe one thing about the 2030, 
plan is it talks about the combination of those you know, there's just some really great narratives uh, written by some of the folks on the line right now um, about how do you bring these uh, different uh, factors into a singular focus. Patty, did you want to jump in? I, I wanted to, um, yes, I did. Thank you, Kim. Um, I wanted to sort of jump onto something that um, Talby said in terms of cutting edge technologies, because that's the world we live in here. And I think St. Louis has a really um, important opportunity to support Talby and Kim. And as a proud member of the CMT board, I know how hard everybody's working on these things. So. It's, um, it's, it's really um, a wonderful thing to see such passion for St. Louis um, in these efforts. But I do think that there are opportunities that we can leverage right now, um, especially in terms of this geospatial push that we're making, that we can really um, look at um, new and interesting ways to support uh, Talby's efforts in building a great system that might include things like, you know, integrated frictionless travel that would, you know, um, that would connect different modes of travel across, um, across venues. Um, of course, I know everybody's concerned about the customer experience, but how can that be um, improved? And, and I know this is something Talby's thinking about all the time, um, but, but we could create, and this doesn't exist yet in St. Louis, we could create innovation sandboxes and accelerators around uh, transit. And these exist in other cities and they don't yet exist in St. Louis. And so for, for problems that um, our, our transit authorities are faced with, um, we could you know, bring our best minds with work to work on these issues together and to present pilot ideas um, and, and potential pilot funding to try some things. And then what works and, and sticks, um, we can move forward with. We could really be seen as a place where cutting edge transit solutions are devised and then implemented. Um, one interesting challenge that's been on my mind lately is, and going to, back to what June said, um, you know, we encounter in a lot of our workforce partners um, that uh, training programs, um, kids don't have ways to get to their training programs mm -hmm. and things. And, and these are um, these have been problems up in our region for years. Um, mm -hmm. I used to um, uh, develop education programs and we had uh, for another organization and we had a lot of problems getting kids from their neighborhoods to those kinds of experiences. And without those kinds of exposures and experiences, we can't, we will have a lot of trouble, um, you know, reaching into the potential workforce opportunities in our underserved neighborhoods in St. Louis. So these are interesting, I think, ideas and opportunities that we could really go after and build some, um, and, and build some expertise around and help Talby and help Kim move the ball forward in terms of innovation in these areas. So Kim, I'd love to go ahead, Jim. Just one thing, uh, you know, when you were asking what our elected leaders could do, uh, and I'd love to hear from Jim on this, but if, again, if, if the elected leaders across the region would say, the 2030 plan is not just the jobs plan, it's not just the private sector plan, it is the beginning of a vision and a plan for this region. And, you know, as we, as we look at decisions on where infrastructure investments are going to be made, if that became part of the lens through which those decisions were vetted, and again, the elected officials sit around the NPO tables, they sit around Jim's table. If that became part of the conversation, I think we would be able to jumpstart a number of things in this region. It's a totally different way to think about how elected officials engage with one another. But again, we, we need new and innovative. And Jim, you can tell me all the reasons why uh, I'm, I'm smoking something on my third floor, but uh, I, just, I, I just think it's a different way to... So 
So thanks Jim, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I was uh, had my placeholder picture on there. I was traveling uh, during this. So um, it's funny you bring that up, June. Just yesterday, I was having that conversation with uh, some people that are engaged through Greater St. Louis Inc. Uh, talking about how we can coordinate some um, some of the different activities that are in that plan, uh, the jobs plan, and um, how we can define what lanes we need uh, help in, whether it's housing, whether it's jobs, whether it's transportation and infrastructure, um, uh, you know, all the different areas that are covered in, in the jobs plan. Um, if we're gonna be implementing it, not one agency is gonna be able to do that for the region. Um, it's going to have to be a collaborative effort that uh, everybody's involved in and everybody's bought into. And uh, to start off or to uh, begin that, that buy-in, back when the plan was being developed, um, I was working with Bruce and Greater St. Louis Inc. Uh, in a couple ways. We, we brought the plan um, through a community forum. We hosted a forum here at Gateway for the public and for elected officials and appointed officials. And then the second uh, way we did it is we brought it to our board to have them start thinking about it. And initially, um, I'll be honest, not all of them were bought into it. Uh, at some level, they thought uh, maybe it was just rearranging the decks on the Titanic. And I don't mean to make it sound so, so drastic, but you know, they, they thought a lot of the things had already been done or um, had, had been attempted and weren't successful. And, you know, frankly, maybe it just wasn't the time for some of the ideas, you know, years ago when it was coming up. Um, but uh, to their credit, Greater St. Louis Inc. and Bruce and others stepped back, um, uh, added a whole lot of uh, listening sessions onto their, their schedule to talk to the elected officials and um, brought those um, into the plan itself. And, and I don't know that it was a major rewrite, but maybe a clarification. I think a lot of people go in with perceptions of, you know, somebody's trying to tell us what to do. And that uh, isn't necessarily what this plan's about. This plan is about helping uh, define, helping um, describe, and helping, um, uh, you know, kind of lay out a path forward on things that we can do to start being su successful and competing with you know, the big metro areas in the country. Um, so I was, I was really impressed by the uh, flexibility of Greater St. Louis Inc. and Bruce on, on, you know, being willing to step back and listen to the elected officials and do that. So all that to say, um, just through the conversation yesterday and conversations I've had with Bruce and others is, you know, our long range plan that we have to develop every four years here in the St. Louis region, as it relates to spending federal funds on roads, bridges, uh, transit, uh, those sorts of things, that is going to be, uh, you know, at least in my opinion, kind of the, the guide for projects. Uh, and that whole process, that whole planning process that we have here at East West Gateway, with the chief elected officials sitting around the table and approving that plan is, is how we would be moving ahead. And then, you know, each year we develop this, this crazy document called the Transportation Improvement Program. It's really uh, the capital program. Um, uh, in order for projects to receive federal funds, they have to be included in this thing. And so, you know, the process behind developing that um, will also help uh, implement Greater St. Louis Inc., or uh, I'm sorry, the jobs plan, at least as it relates to the infrastructure piece of things. Um, you know, the other thing we're doing uh, through the development of our, th this next development of our long range plan is looking to see if the priority areas that we currently use are still relevant for St. Louis and still relevant for us. So we're gonna be doing, a, I don't know if it's a major overhaul, but a semi-major overhaul, uh, looking at those priority areas and um, what that really does is establish a blueprint for how we want to make investment in the region. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or if I just kind of talked in circles around <laughs> what you're wanting. But bottom line, we're, we are engaging the elected officials uh, in this and uh, doing it through our long range plan, through our TIP, 
uh, through conversations. You know, we had the, the conversation several months ago about uh, the jobs plan and my plan is to bring it back again. Uh, it may not be this calendar year yet, but to bring it back maybe uh, January or so to, to talk about how we're gonna be moving ahead to implement this thing. Hopefully by then we'll have some, uh, some of those sectors and uh, thought leaders and, and regional leaders identified as to how we're gonna be moving ahead on the different pieces of the plans. So. Yeah, Jim, I can't, I can't let you go without saying on behalf of Greater St. Louis Sink and the team that worked on the plan, just a huge thank you, you know, to you and your team, the, um, the collaboration that you had, you know, allowing us to come you know, to, to the board, to the, to the EAC, um, some of the other you know, conversations that you helped facilitate really just were invaluable. Um, and I think that the, the dialogue, the questions, the, the healthy debate um, on, only strengthen the final product of the plan. So I think it's a really good example of, 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 of public and private working together and the, the, the outcome of that being, being far richer um, from the, the exchanges that took place. So thank you and um, welcome, you know, welcome opportunities to, to continue that conversation over the next decade as we, as we implement. Yeah, thanks. The, the other thing, June, really quick, um, the board, um, a few years ago, we had a, a retreat, we'll call it. Uh, we were talking about um, how we wanted to start doing business as an agency. Um, yeah, and some of it was the same, but some of it was different in the sense of, um, prior to that, um, it really just been government focusing on government stuff, <laughs> focusing on that. Um, my push at the time and uh, the board, um, uh, has uh, embraced it is that uh, we look at uh, business and not-for-profit and government and kind of all the things we do and try to work uh, toward including those those other two groups, you know, the business and the not-for-profit groups um, in the decisions and in the um, kind of the processes and in the direction we're trying to go as a region. So. Thank you, Jim, for jumping in. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. Even this dialogue, I think, is very optimistic. We're using words like changing the lens and opportunities for moving forward. And I think, Patty, you touched on it a little bit. But how can the goals of organizations like BJC and T-Rex, and um, Sam, you also touched on it a little bit as well, and Greater St. Louis, Inc., impact the transit conversation in the region? What do you think, what other steps do you think that your organizations could take to potentially impact that conversation? And, and Patty, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the opportunities for innovation within transit and making it a cutting edge transit solutions with the help of T-Rex, but what other opportunities are out there for your organizations to help further the transit conversation in the region? I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. I, I guess I'll just go back to the innovation discussion. Um, there are tools and resources that um, we can bring to bear to help support um, uh, innovation in terms of transit. Um, and I'll just give you one example. Um, with this extended reality lab that we will be building and, and um, standing up there, um, we're in conversation with uh, quite a few people about creating a digital twin. Um, not that we would do, not that necessarily we would do that, but if we can bring resources to bear together in partnerships, those are things that can help planners, can help Jim, can help Talby as they move forward to um, creating um, the best routes, different scenarios, um, how do people move across different jurisdictions, working with uh, governance partners. Those are uh, technologies that can really help um, move things forward. So, um, so I think that so I think that working together and sharing data, uh, data sharing, it would be huge. <laughs> and, um, and that alone could, could really um, um, augment uh, efforts around innovation. Thank you, Patty. Does anyone else want to jump in? 
Sure, I can I can add from the perspective of Greater St. Louis, Inc., Kim. I think kind of two two ways that we'll we'll continue to be highly engaged um, around transit and other issues. I mean, one is one is formalizing you know relationships with other organizations, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I'm now uh, representing Greater St. Louis, Inc. and the and the, the business community on Jim's uh, executive advisory committee, and we'll be pleased to be you know in, engaging in that forum to to make sure that the that our point of view is a part of those. A part of those planning com conversations. I think that's really important for us to have um, kind of a, a, a streamlined uh, channel for two-way dialogue uh, between the, the planning organization and the, and the business community. And, and then second, um, through the, the combination that created Greater St. Louis Inc., um, you know, one of the key components that we brought into the new organization is the, 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 the public policy and advocacy uh, capabilities that had previously been part of the St. Louis Regional Chamber. Um, and so we do have a, a, a dedicated team of public policy professionals um, who will continue to, to advocate at the local, state, and federal level um, on behalf of the St. Louis business community and, and, and transit um, will be one of the key priorities that remains on that, on that agenda. Um, again, an example of that from this year was our, our direct advocacy and engagement around uh, the increase in the motor fuel tax. So um, transit is a priority for Greater St. Louis Inc. Public policy um, and advocacy is one of our core capabilities and we'll continue to deploy that um, as, as we move forward. So um, another question, barriers to transportation play a role in the lack of economic opportunity within the region. We've already talked about the north side. Um, what policies do you believe can be put in place to reduce the gap and increase economic opportunities for all? So I, I'll jump in here, uh, Kim, if that's okay. So. Um, so I, I do, look, we've been through a really difficult uh, situation with the pandemic, but there, are, one thing about something when you're kind of in the breach and the difficulty of, a, of really, of a, in this case, a pandemic, is that what are, what does it also tell you about the fundamental service that you offer? And right, it's had a devastating impact on our ridership. But there is a fundamental piece of ridership that is still there that we're still moving across the region, you know, and actually those are the essential workers, the very most important individuals that we need to get to those jobs at the hospitals and in the grocery stores and so on. And being sure that we are taking that fundamental population into, uh, into account and serving their needs into all of these neighborhoods is a critical part of keeping our fundamental workforce, our essential workers, getting to jobs. And one, one thing that I just can't resist, but the, the, labor, the Secretary of Labor happened to be in town uh, lately, uh, Mr. Walsh, and he mentioned a really interesting Bureau of Labor statistic, and that is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics was talking about nearly 58% of individuals looking for a job were in the need of upskilling or coaching and education. And of course, how do, how do you get the, to that? And you got to get the folks there. You got to get them to the sector-based training, to the apprenticeship programs, to most importantly, the community college access, right? And one really key distinguishing uh, part, um, and Hart Nelson, I know I'm getting on your good side now, is, is getting access to those educational components, whether that be Washington University, St. Louis University, St. Louis Community College, UMSL, all of those accessible by transit and into these corners of our community. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna get to those, we have to remove the barriers. We have to get folks there. And uh, it's a really important aspect of figuring out what those barriers are and trying to sweep them away so that we are looking at our educational attainment and indeed our, our equity lens as far as opportunity, economic opportunity from the top all the way to the bottom. Thank you. So I, I know we're... Oh, go ahead, Bruce. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I would just add one thing, which I know is very much part of the administration's focus um, as, as we begin to hopefully finalize large volumes of infrastructure spending, is to use infrastructure spending and procurement 
uh, to grow black and brown owned business because they have been disproportionately devastated by the pandemic. So a very big part of the 2030 jobs plan was supply STL, which when it was initially written was focusing on private and nonprofit anchor employers and others uh, to use procurement to grow black and brown business. But infrastructure spending, I think in the next three to six months, we'll get a lot more attention as a business building vehicle. Thank you, Bruce. So I, I know we're getting close to our time and I always like to wrap these conversations that we have at CMT with asking each of our panelists to weigh in on what is the key takeaway to our audience on the intersection of jobs and transit from your perspective? And how can individuals, companies, and stakeholders impact these decisions that are happening right now for our 2030 future? Would anyone like to go first? Okay. Tommy, oh, would you like uh, to? Oh, oh, go ahead, June. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go first. This, this is you. an area I love. I think that individuals on this call and uh, those whom you uh, can influence and who will listen to you, we have got to have different conversations with our elected officials. Uh, just as it took the business community uh, uh, a little while to figure out how to come together and speak with one voice, not only on issues that are clearly business issues, but as Sam said, you know, weighing in on a gas tax, weighing in on Medicaid expansion, weighing in on um, the, the opportunity to invest in the St. Louis Community College. The business community has started to speak with one voice in St. Louis. And I will tell you, we didn't know that that was possible. I, and, and it came from a push from inside and from outside. So I think if people, if folks on, on this call who care about transit, who care about the future of our region, really want to engage, write your elected officials, not to complain about something, but to say, you know, I encourage you to think about acting as a collective. I don't care what the structure of government is. You can act as a, as a collective, even in your individual um, elected role. So if, if we as citizens encourage our elected officials to do that, and start to hold them accountable, I think that will start to change the trajectory of, of our region. Thank you, June. Yep, so I'm gonna jump on that. So same as, put your, put your shoulder into these ideas. Look, as a community, some of the greatest ideas that I believe that we've been able to be successful at were, were generated from local initiatives. Things like Zoo Museum Tax District, things like transit tax, things like a self-taxing initiative, I would point out, where individual people decided this is what we want to see in our region. We have had a history of success there. The question is, do we take the good ideas that are articulated in things like 2030 or articulated in some of these ideas about truly being equitable and put our collective shoulder into them? Our electeds want to lead, but, but we need to have a parade behind them. And we need to push these ideas together as a community. And once we have that community uh, voice, we are able to build the momentum and find the capital. Absolutely. Great. Bruce, Sam, Patty, any final words? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah, same here. Amen to what Talvi and June said. And and one, transit, I just wrote this down, so I got to share it. Transit is really, really provides the arteries of a productive, inclusive economy. And we need everybody to support good transit in St. Louis. Thank you, Patty. Sam? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll just I'll just reiterate what Jim said that you know no 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 one agency no one group can can do this on on its own and we as the business community stand ready to partner um, you know with with our colleagues in both the the, the, the private sector and the public sector um, to move these these priorities forward it really is is critical this is this is our decade um, to to change the trajectory of St Louis and, and move us in a direction of inclusive growth and 
we, we all have to work together to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today for joining us. And thank you to everyone who has joined us this morning for this really important conversation that is happening right now in St. Louis to look to the future 2030 as we've heard this morning. We will post this video to our social channels later this morning for anyone who is interested in re-watching or sharing it with your colleagues. I did also want to mention that it ties right in with all of our speakers' takeaways this morning that the CMT annual meeting is set for September 16th. And our keynote this year is a panel conversation of our three locally elected officials. And the title of that keynote is Success of Transit is Rooted in Regional Collaboration. So we will be hearing from Mayor Jones and County Executive Page and Board Chair Mark Kern on what the future of transit looks like in the region and how regional collaboration is key to that success. So please look for additional information about our upcoming programs on our website at cmt-stl.org. Thank you again to all of CMT sponsors that make these conversations possible and the advocacy work that we do possible. Um, and hopefully, if you're not a member of Citizens for Modern Transit, this is my, my weekly plug. I hope you'll consider joining us in our mission to move transit forward in the St. Louis region. Thank you, everyone, and make it a great day. Thank you.